Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Acceptable Nutrient Inputs for the Modern Turf Manager, a discussion of chemical fertilizers, bridge products, and bionutrition. Today's edition is the first in a series that we are calling Lawn Care in the 21st Century. My name is Dick Conley, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Many people credit the first color broadcast of the Masters Golf Tournament in 1966 as the birth of the professional lawn care industry. Never before had such brilliant green and healthy turf been so prominently displayed and envied by millions of Americans on the national stage. Since that time, there had been very little change in the way that lawn care services and turf managers provided a quality end product. The recipe was to pump as much nitrogen into the turf while preventing turf problems with blanket applications of pesticides. The industry remained almost unchanged for close to 40 years. If you're in the industry, and it's likely you are, you know that there's, this is no longer the case. Increased pressures from environmental and health concerns have called into question the use of many products in the lawn care industry. Rising costs associated with raw materials found in the fertilizer have caused many suppliers to seek out alternatives. The industry that once filled with cookie cutter suppliers and dominated by corporate providers is now evolving at a pace that could leave many companies behind. The greatest challenge today is trying to figure out how to survive and prosper in a world that is constantly changing. The Natural Technologies webinar series, Lawn Care in the 21st Century, will set out in an effort to make sense of it all and help progressive minded companies and turf managers advance in what has become a very changeable environment. I'm here with Tom Kelly today. Tom is currently the Vice President of Natural Technologies and he heads up the direction of our Be Safe Organic Land Care Dealer Network. He'd had a long career in the green industry and Tom, before you get started on today's topic, I think it makes sense for you to give the audience an introduction of yourself and perhaps share a little bit of your history. Thank you, Dick. <clears throat> I've spent my entire life in the lawn care industry and without a doubt it's been great to me. As a young man, I was able to build a successful business and spent many years with hardworking and dedicated colleagues and associates. I was able to learn trade and continue on into my 30s making a decent living doing something that I enjoyed. I grew a lawn care business called The Lawn Dog from a startup that opened with two partners in 1997 to a business that serviced more than 20,000 customers at its height. However, during that period, there were times when I questioned some of the practices involved with chemical lawn care. I first questioned things back in the mid-90s when as a lawn technician for one of the nation's largest corporate lawn care providers, I was asked to give a blood sample twice per year. This was to measure cholinesterase which is an enzyme that humans need for the proper function of the central nervous system. Some of the products that we used on a daily basis were considered cholinesterase inhibitors and were designed to kill insects by damaging their central nervous system. Every year several employees would have to come off the road and work in the office until their blood levels were back to normal. If that wasn't a red flag I'm not sure what was but being young and wanting to be a dedicated employee I kept my concerns to myself. In recent years, as the industry has evolved and the EPA has banned many of the chemicals we were using at the time, it looked like things were going to get better. However, some of the newer insecticides that were deemed safer are being blamed on decreases in populations of bees. I'm sure that many of you have had direct experience with the most recent issue concerning newer generation products and the failure of Imprelis. When the EPA solved one issue, it looks like it may have opened up the door to many newer issues. I remain skeptical. There are times when I'm mistaken for being an anti-pesticide zealot or crusader and that really just isn't the case. I've simply spent many years on the front lines of the lawn care business and there really isn't a product that's been on the market that hasn't been in the back of one of my trucks or that I've had first-hand experience with. After studying more than a few different means to create healthy turf, I simply have come to the firm understanding that for the most part, the way most of us have been taught turf care is completely backwards and incorrect. It's this knowledge that I think we can all arm ourselves with as we move into a new era. It's what we consider lawn care for the 21st century. With that being said, why don't we get right into today's presentation. Tom, you finished up the last segment by stating that you think we're all moving into an era of improved turf care. By saying that, it would appear that you're indicating that the present or previous era of turf care leaves something to be desired. 
What exactly is the problem with the way turf managers have done their job in the past? Dick, I'm not sure it should be defined as a problem as much as it's the ability of being able to accept or embrace change. In this particular case, change represents improvement, and today we're going to focus on the most important changes in technology around methods of turf nutrition. As the title of today's webinar suggests, Acceptable Nutrient Inputs for the Modern Turf Manager, we are again inferring that some existing nutrient inputs are no longer acceptable. And this is true to a point. Today's chemical fertilizers have fallen under incredible scrutiny in recent years for a whole host of reasons. I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about synthetic and chemical fertilizers here because our goal is, in is to introduce some of the modern alternatives to simply fertilizing with large amounts of urea. Tom, haven't many localities begun to regulate the use of some chemical fertilizers? Yeah, and, and many of you are in areas where nitrogen and phosphorus have come under attack for being the main culprits and causing water quality issues. It seems like every day there's another state or locality implementing either an outright ban on lawn fertilizers or at the very least restricting the seasonal timing in which these products can be applied. It's scientifically proven that the nitrogen and phosphorus in chemical synthetic fertilizers are to blame for algae blooms in surface water. And many of our state and local governments have decided that it makes sense to regulate the use of these products. Secondly, in case you haven't noticed, and I'm sure you have, the cost of a bag of FERT has skyrocketed in recent years, and the manufacturers of these products have warned us that this trend is going to continue. The reason is, as you know, is, is that urea is a petroleum-based product. It takes an incredible amount of fossil fuels to produce synthetic fertilizer, and the trend in today's day and age isn't exactly about finding out how many different ways we can overuse oil. Finally, and most importantly, at least as it relates to today's discussion, is the fact that the overuse of chemical fertilizers on our lawns has left our soils completely deplete, depleted of any biological value whatsoever. A little bit later in the presentation, we will discuss the soil food web and how sterilized soil is probably the biggest issue facing any turf manager today. In fact, when you come to understand the process in which chemical fertilizer destroys the soil, you can begin to understand why it appears that your turf has become physically addicted to fertilizer applications. With no biological value in the soil, the turf that you're caring for has become a drug addict. Its quality will decline when the nutrients you provide have been used up, and it will not respond in a positive way until you give it more. In the process of the ups and downs, it becomes stressed out and erratic. The fact that turf has become physically addicted to chemicals isn't a terrible thing, if you're the manufacturer of those fertilizers or a corporate lawn care service treating millions of lawns. It is, however, if you're interested in creating sustainable turf. Hey, Tom, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I, I think we need to get back on track. So let's start to focus on how we can actually make some improvements in uh, what we're all doing here in uh, terms of turf fertility. Nope, no problem, Dick. Sometimes I need to be cut off uh, or I can ramble. But uh, okay, the most important thing in determining what type of fertility is necessary under any circumstances, it's first necessary to determine what kind of plant you're actually fertilizing. Secondly, it's important to determine what type of nutrient requirement that plant actually has. Now, we won't spend a lot of time discussing the identification and needs of dozens of different turf grass species, but we at least need a baseline. And at the conclusion of this section, it will help us to perhaps make the most important point of the entire presentation. As you all know, turf grass types are broken down into three categories. There are warm season turf grasses, there are cool season turf grasses, and there are transition zone turf grasses. The transition, is, the transition zone is essentially a combination of warm and cool season grasses. Those of you in the transition no, zone know exactly how challenging things can be when you're dealing with two, three, and even four different types of turf, especially when you have something like Kentucky bluegrass, not far from a lawn that may be something like zoysia. The nutrient requirements of these two turf types are very different. Okay, quickly, let's just touch on some of the major turf types in each zone. Uh, the major cool season turf types are as followed. The fine fescue family, uh, which includes chewing fescue, creeping red fescue, and hard fescue. This turf type is known to be very low maintenance and does very well in the shade. Fine fescue isn't a great choice for areas of high traffic, and it's known to build up a significant thatch zone when it's in the sun, 
but the benefits are that it's a slow grow and requi requires little care. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass is usually what people think about when they consider cool season turf types. When Kentucky bluegrass looks good, it looks really good. But it's also a high maintenance turf type and has high nutrient requirements and is very vulnerable to heat and drought. It definitely doesn't do well in the shade and many turf managers are apt to make mistakes with its care. When things go wrong with bluegrass, they go really wrong. Perennial ryegrass is one of the most commonly found cool season turf types and it's usually found in seed blends that also contain Kentucky Blue. Perennial rye does fairly well in both the sun and the shade, but requires frequent watering dur during dry periods and has moderate fertilization requirements. Okay, some of the major warm season turf grasses are, are as followed. St. Augustine grass. It's probably the most commonly found warm season turf grass. It thrives in the heat and can usually withstand moderate drought conditions. Its nutrient requirements are middle of the road, but it's certainly not considered a low fertility grass type. Bermuda grass is also a very common turf type in the south, and that's for good reason. It looks nice, it thrives in full sun, it's fairly drought resistant, and can handle stress as a result of traffic very well. The downside is that it requires more nitrogen than any other turf type. A couple others real quick are centipede grass, which is a thick, dense turf that, combi that combats weeds very well. Uh, it has a very low nutrient requirement. Zoysia grass has become more popular recently with newer varieties being introduced. It's extremely drought tolerant and has moderate nutrient requirements. Um, finally, as we said before, the transition zone is a combination of northern and southern turf types. Except for one notably missing grass that has become more common in the last decade or so, uh, turf type tall fescue is a combination of what has the color and growth habits of a Kentucky bluegrass with the resilience of an old fashioned tall fescue blend. The nutrient requirements are relatively low compared to many other su southern varieties. Uh, Tom, I can see how difficult it would be to run a lawn care service business when you're dealing with so many grass types, especially in the transition zone. Uh, but we know for a fact there are very few companies that really take this into consideration when putting together their fertilizer programs. I would assume that many of the uh, nutrient requirements are very different for each of the grass types. I mean, you don't fertilize every plant the same way, do you? A large tree obviously requires different care than, say, a bean plant. No, you're right. Uh, and this is a, an issue in the industry. In fact, you don't provide the same amount of fertilizer for a bean plant, even compared to a tomato plant or a corn plant. Each genetically specific species has different nutrient requirements because they're different plants. You can't treat every plant the same, and you certainly can't treat every turf type the same. We need to determine the nutrient requirements of different turf types before we can discuss their sources. Because nitrogen is the biggest factor in terms of growth and color, why don't we focus on nitrogen requirements specifically? Without, without going into too much detail here, let's start with the cool season turf grasses. Uh, in terms of nitrogen requirements, the fine fescues require one to three pounds of N per year. Perennial ryegrass needs two to four pounds of N per year. The same goes for Kentucky bluegrass, and I think it's probably on the higher side of two to four. Some would suggest even close to five. Uh, now with the warm season turf grasses, a turf, like, uh, a turf like St. Augustine will require three to four pounds of nitrogen per growing season, while improved Bermuda grasses will need closer to somewhere between four and seven pounds per thousand square feet. Zoysia will be lower in the area of two to four, uh, and centipede uh, is, is the lowest, requiring only about a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. With the transition zone, a turf type tall fescue will, will need about two to four pounds per thousand square feet. Okay, so now that we know our turf types and their nutrient requirements, I think some of you may be questioning why it is that most common fertilizer programs have you showing up at least six times per year, applying six applications of high nitrogen chemical fertilizer. If that's making you scratch your head a little bit, wait until you consider this. The chart here describes the growing patterns of both cool and warm season turf types. As you can see, they're very different. Cool season turf types have two very distinct growth phases, while warm season is more like six months of steady growth. Let me ask you this. With what we know now, does it make sense to fertilize with high nitrogen products if the grass can't use it? Not at all. Any nitrogen application performed in the north during the summer is essentially a waste. Again, in the south, does it make sense to fertilize in March or November if the turf isn't even going to use it? Not at all. 
In fact, many turf managers are now beginning to realize that the improper application of high nitrogen fertilizers when the turf isn't naturally going to utilize it is what's causing many of the challenges that they face today. Why on earth would you want to be causing stress while you as a turf manager should be trying to prevent stress? Your customers certainly don't complain when the lawn looks great and they really don't even complain when it looks normal. They will complain when your turf is stressed out. So Tom, I just read The Da Vinci Code, so my mind is all about conspiracies. And I don't want to go all conspiracy theory here in the lawn care business, but it looks like you could be uncovering one of the biggest misconceptions in lawn care. I'm a novice, I'm not gonna hide that, but it doesn't seem too complicated to me. You fertilize when the lawn needs it, and you don't when it doesn't. What exactly are these guys doing that, uh, or what should they be doing to make changes to their program? Wait a minute, did you say you read The Da Vinci Code? I read it. Yeah, okay. I, read I think it. maybe you saw the movie. If I know you weren't exactly reading The Da Vinci Code, I, read, but I, I think The Da Vinci Code was on HBO last week. All right. But no, you're right. That's the question we should all be asking ourselves at this point. In fact, it's pretty amazing that it's taken this long for most of us to actually question the status quo, especially when it's not too much of a stretch to understand that the over-application or perhaps the misapplication of chemical sources of nitrogen can create so many issues. Again, the drug addict metaphor fits perfectly. Turf becomes addicted to fertilizer and then gets stressed out when it doesn't have what it needs. To take it a step further, we can see that the turf begins to act in a way that's completely unnatural or even inappropriate when it gets too much fertilizer, causing unnatural growth or growth at a time when it's completely genetically inappropriate for it to be growing may help appearance in the very short term, but it causes all kinds of problems. Have you ever seen a drug addict when they're high? Do they appear normal to you? How about when they begin to come down? They look pretty stressed out, don't they? Okay, so the first thing in terms of making some beneficial changes is to actually acknowledge that there's a different way to accomplish what you're setting out to do. And again, not to go conspiracy theory here, but the people that you've been buying your fertilizer for from don't exactly uh, want you to think this way. Now it's a great time to take a closer look at some of the alternatives we've been talking about. But before we do, I think we should make one more thing perfectly clear. Many of you who are on today's webinar have already done some experimenting with some of these alternative products. For a while, it was fashionable to offer an organic lawn care program to meet the demand of your current or potential clients. Unfortunately, many companies out there failed pretty quickly when it came to implementing that type of program. And believe it or not, the answer as to why is about as simple as it gets. But for some reason, it's been lost on, on most of us. When it comes to fertility, there are basically two types of nitrogen avail avail availability. There's water-soluble nitrogen and there's water-insoluble nitrogen. For the most part, chemical fertilizers, or urea specifically as a source of nitrogen, is a water-soluble source. Organic fertilizers, and let's take corn gluten or, or a soy-based fertilizer, um, they're actually water-insoluble. Maybe a better example would be a fertilizer with nutrients derived from, from feather meal or bone meal. Uh, let's take a quick look at this video we put together to explain exactly what we're talking about here. Okay, so if you check out this, this uh, really high-tech video we put together here, uh, you can see that we've got two different types of fertilizer and two mason jars. What I'm putting in this mason jar right now is basically urea. It's 4600. Uh, it's, it's the common chemical fertilizer. In this cup here, I've got a, a sample of an organic fertilizer. It's actually a brand name, retail uh, brand, and, and the nutrients are derived from uh, bone meal and feather meal. When I shake up the, the mason jar that has the urea in it, watch what happens. And you guys all know this. We've, we've all sprayed or, or applied urea fertilizer before. It dissolves almost immediately. That's called wa being water soluble. It's dissolving. Now imagine what happens when you put that on somebody's lawn um, and it gets rained on. For one thing, it's going to be completely uh, uh, available to the plant, but it's going to leach as well. Look at this water insoluble source of fertilizer. No matter how hard um, I try to shake it up here, it's not going to dissolve. So when you apply a product like that to your customers' lawns, it's going to just you know, basically sit there uh, and not break down. And we've done this a few times and left it in the mason jar for up to uh, a couple of weeks, and it doesn't break down at all. 
So uh, essentially, it's a waste of time and, and money. And that's why your organic fertilizer programs didn't work. It doesn't exactly seem uh, too complicated, but that's the case. So again, Tom, as a novice, this isn't something that's coming off incredibly complicated to me. If it's water soluble, it's available immediately. If it's water insoluble, it's not available immediately. I'm not sure I see the issue here. Is it something fairly obvious that I'm missing? Um, Dick, uh, perhaps it's because you're a novice that it seems to be simple. But the fact is that for some reason, it's really not. I think that because our industry went for so very long with so few changes, there are many issues that are just simply too established to question. And the source and timing of fertilizer treatments is one of them. Many of us just assume that all of these products were simply interchangeable. You know, that if you were using a chemical fertilizer with an analysis of, say, 1835 at four pounds per thousand square feet to get seven tenths of a pound of N, you could simply double that amount when you're putting down, say, a 913 organic fertilizer. Many of us did that as we began to experiment with organics, and we simply saw no results. Now we know that it was because the N was coming from a water insoluble source of food and without soil biology, it just wouldn't break down to become available to the turf. Okay, so the whole point of the webinar was to talk about acceptable options for turf fertility. So far, you've done a pretty good job about explaining why chemical fertilizers are no longer an acceptable option. So where do we go from here? Actually, no, I, I hope I didn't come off that strong. I think that the incorrect use of chemical fertilizers is no, is no longer acceptable. That's been validated by our legislators uh, they've begun to pass laws that s say the same thing. It's up to you in the audience to form your own opinion as to how you feel about synthetic nitrogen. But the fact is that there are hundreds of millions of applications of chemical fertilizers done every year. That's not something that's going to change overnight, but I think it's important that we look at some of the alternatives. So you didn't bring it up because you're probably not looking at the screen here, but uh, I'm not saying that you're Kim Jong-il. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying you're not Kim Jong-il. Well, you know, we always say we're, we're not so far to the left that we're, we're unrealistic. Obviously, you know, the, every single lawn care company in the world applies chemical fertilizers. We think that the same um, results or better results can be delivered by thinking outside of the box a little bit. I don't know if you're trying to say I look like Kim Jong-il or if I'm thinking like Kim Jong-il or what. But I'm just saying you're not. Okay. I mean, you're not. All right. I know it's a subject we could easily spend hours discussing. Uh, but for that reason, let's take a look at some of the alternatives. Unfortunately, we'll have to save the details for another session, but, you, you know, we have to start somewhere. It all starts with this concept. Soils containing 4% organic matter in the top 7 inches have 80,000 pounds of organic matter per acre. That 80,000 pounds of organic matter will contain approximately 5.25% nitrogen, amounting to 4,200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Assuming a 5% release rate during the growing season, that organic matter could therefore supply 210 pounds of nitrogen per acre, or almost five pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. Now, do all soils contain 4% organic matter? In most cases, they don't. But when you discontinue the use of products that destroy soil biology and begin to promote a system that builds organic matter, you'll see that percent rise immediately. Imagine a lawn that actually feeds itself. It's actually possible. So what are your options? First, um, there are bridge products. Just as the name suggests, these products are fertilizers that lean towards organic but don't make the entire jump. In most cases, they contain natural inputs and sources of nitrogen, but also contain a chemical source as well. A good example of a bridge product would be a fertilizer that's partially made up of nitrogen that's derived from soy, feather meal, or bone meal, and of nitrogen that's derived from urea. The percent nitrogen is usually high enough where you can reduce the pounds per thousand square feet to keep it somewhat affordable, um, but it's important to note here that a granular bridge product should not be considered organic, nor should it be advertised as such. Another example of a bridge product that's become very popular uh, recently are, are liquid formulations that contain nitrogen derived from urea, but also contain many of the necessary inputs to begin to, to make the conversion to an organic program. These products are considered to be bio-enhanced, and that they contain biostimulants like kelp and humic acid. 
The goal of the product is to not only feed the turf via a nitrogen source, but also to improve the soil. Because the products are liquid, you get an immediate response from the grass in terms of greening and growth, but the added soil, improve, uh, the, the added soil improving ingredients also help begin the, the, to improve the soil profile. With the rising cost of urea as the main component of chemical fertilizers, these liquid bridge products have become much more acceptable even within the confines of a totally chemical program. In fact, in many cases, they're actually cheaper. Tom, are you saying that companies can implement organic elements into their chemical program and actually reduce their annual product costs? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to go all Da Vinci code on you here, but I think that uh, there's probably um, a couple of larger corporations that don't want you to know about that. But uh, yeah, and many companies have begun to do just that. Um, one example of another bridge product that's become more and more popular in recent years are biosolids. Biosolids are reconstituted and treated human sewage. Um, many manufacturers blend these biosolids with other sources of nitrogen, like urea, uh, to form fast-acting and what, would, what some would consider as, as natural fertilizers. Uh, the cost of these products is very attractive to companies who are attempting to find cheaper ways to treat lawns. But the fact that they're created from actual human waste uh, is a turnoff to most. No matter how you feel about biosolids, I would implore you to not promote them as being organic, as they are certainly not acceptable under any organic standards today, uh, largely because of concerns over heavy metals uh, and other potential negative components. Personally, I'm not a big fan of biosolids, uh, and, and I'm even a bigger adversary to companies who try to promote themselves as, as organic because they use them. It's actually pretty gross if you think about it. Uh, is there any danger to the employees who apply them all day? Um, I'd have to stop short of saying that uh, on the record that there's a proven danger, but I can't imagine that breathing the dust from sewage all day uh, is a good thing. I've used biosolids in the past, uh, and it became a concern. The products are dusty. Uh, when you're behind a spreader all day long, uh, week after week, I would assume that it's probably not a good thing. I've heard it referred to as poop dust. Yeah, it, it could uh, makes the grass green, though. Yeah, sure. So we're beginning to run long here. Are there any other possibilities, Tom? Yeah. Uh, finally, the use of natural inputs combined with uh, bionutrition, meaning active soil microorganisms are gaining in popularity. Uh, that's what we do here at Be Safe too. Um, you know, there's a microscopic feeding frenzy going on beneath your turf. It's a feeding frenzy that begins at the lowest level of microscopic uh, food chains and continues right up to things that you can see, uh, like earthworms. You know, who would have thought that there are actually billions of single-celled bacteria and fungi even in a teaspoon of healthy soil? To get into a scientific discussion about the soil food web here would be difficult within the confines of this webinar, uh, but in recent years there's been many scientific documents, essays, studies, and books written on the topic. Uh, you know, as we continue to move toward a food supply that revolves around the limited uses of chemicals to increase crop yield. It's a complex world of microorganisms, insects and animals, and the symbiotic relationship that exists between them that when properly understood and supported can really push a truly organic approach to turf care. As demand for organic fruits and vegetables continued to soar, so did research into effective ways to produce them. There's no doubt that you've noticed that the organic produce section of your grocery store has multiplied uh, several times over in the last five years. And this isn't a only a result of the demand for these products, but more so the farmer's ability to successfully supply them uh, in an economic manner. Much of this can be attributed to a better understanding of the soil food web. A healthy soil produces healthy plants. A healthy soil can create a thick, healthy stand of turf grass, too. Unfortunately for many, the process of introducing the proper consortium and species of bacteria and fungi can be difficult to figure out. Uh, this is certainly a topic for an entire webinar uh, in and of itself, and we'll probably do one as part of our series. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, it's also what, what we do here at Be Safe, or at least one part of what we do here at Be Safe. Thanks, Tom. So the goal here today was to get you to consider how to begin implementing a program of nutrient inputs that is different than the standard six or seven treatment chemical program that you guys are probably doing nowadays. We've determined that when you attempt to build soil biology, which in turn builds soil organic matter, you can find a way to reduce your chemical inputs. 
Sometimes it's a long process that leads up to that point, and many companies aren't exactly in a position to make wholesale changes to their existing business. But if there's one thing I'd like you to take from today's presentation, it's that there are many different ways to begin the process. Perhaps you'll be forward-thinking enough to implement a program that revolves around 100% organic methods in soil biology. Perhaps you can honestly begin to transition your customer base to a more sensible approach. At the very least, you should consider replacing one of your chemical fertilizer treatments to a more suitable application. If you're in the north, it would make sense to switch out a fertilizer treatment during the time of year when your turf isn't growing. If you're in the south, this would be early and late in the growing season. Perhaps if you aren't in the business as of yet, today's webinar made you consider the possibilities from a perspective that isn't based on what the big guys are doing. Change is imminent, and it will take creative business owners like you guys to make it happen. Great. Thanks, Tom. So that's pretty much going to conclude the webinar today. Uh, a lot of you have been uh, throwing good questions at us uh, throughout the webinar here. So we're going to start answering them. Certainly, if you have any questions uh, moving forward, feel free to type them in, and uh, we'll get those answered as well. So uh, let's open it up for some Q&A.